Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, so now I'm currently working as a, as a postdoc at the Neural Computation Lab at the Italian Institute of Technology uh, based in Genoa, but actually uh, the work that I'm going to talk about was developed previously uh, as a part of my PhD thesis that was prepared between uh, the math department in Bologna and the CAMS lab in Paris. And it's roughly contained in these two works. Can you see my um, mouse? Okay, pointer. Thanks. Uh, in these two works uh, published in 2019 and 2020. So we focus on modeling the, the functional architecture of, of V1, the primary visual cortex. And the idea was to, um, to find an explicit link between the geometry of the feet forward connections entering V1 and the geometry of the lateral connections happening uh, within this area. So, mm, Specifically, we characterize the interactions between uh, units in the one in terms of a distance that is defined on a space of features. And it's induced by the uh, receptive profiles of the cells. Um, so basically, given a, uh, some, any family of receptive profiles, we want to develop a method to uh, compute the uh, connectivity pattern associated with them. So I'll start by showing uh, how this distance looks like in the most uh, simplest possible description of, uh, of receptive profiles, a simple cells in V1 that is a family of Gabber filters with varying positions and orientations. But then our framework also applies to, uh, can be used for modeling the connectivity induced by more realistic representations, uh, in, including for instance, orientation maps, or to different types of feature selectivity, and uh, specifically the um, a family of end stopped profiles selected to curvature. And finally, I'll show that we do not need uh, any um, pre-existing parameterization or ordering on the fiber to um, for our approach to, to work for um, to, to compute the connectivity associated to a bank of learned profiles. So uh, first I want to set a few notations. Um, so when I talk about fit forward connections entering the one, I'm referring to the transformation of a retinal um, image to the corresponding cortical activation. So an image on the retina is lifted from the original spatial coordinates to a set of cortical coordinates that encode not only position, but uh, possibly other features such as orientation, scale, and so on. So V1 can be modeled as a space of features. Now, on the other hand, lateral connections link units that belong to the same area. So um, we can think about them as a, a kernel, a connectivity kernel that expresses the strength of interaction between uh, points of the feature space. Uh, so we want to define such a kernel and we are interested in the emergence of uh, structures, geometric structures that are compatible with the known properties of, um, of lateral connectivity. So specifically, uh, we are talking about long range connectivity that extends uh, beyond the extent of the receptive fields of the neurons and uh, most importantly, uh, it's orientation specific, as Sean was saying, so it extends along the, the, the axis of the preferred orientation of the, of the starting neuron and tends to target cells that are uh, oriented coherently and in line with this axis. So these properties also reflect on the, on the perceptual size, side um, uh, through mechanisms that are linked to perceptual integration, to contour integration that are, uh, that can be summarized by the concept of association fields. So uh, the fact that our perception of an oriented element is amplified by the presence of nearby uh, edge elements that are either collinear or co-circular with it. So, um, Feed forward connections uh, entering the one can be, uh, let's say, simplified as a linear filtering operation um, that approximates the response of the one simple cells to a retinal image. So the input uh, would be a function i defined on the retinal plane, that is our image, and this is filtered by a, a receptive profile of each neuron. 
So where the receptor for five is a function uh, describing the impulse response of the neuron, and it's typically defined onto a local domain of the retinal rays called the receptor field. So this output H um, approximates the, 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 so the filtering, the output of this filtering approximates the response of one single cell to, to, the, image, uh, to the image I. But let's suppose that we have a whole family of, um, of um, receptive profiles. So the simplest possible way in which um, simple profiles of simple cells can be modeled is by um, translations and rotations of, of one uh, base filter size zero. And so in this case, we would have a family of filters that are indexed by a position x, y in R2 and an orientation theta in S1. So uh, the feature space that is associated with this family of filters is uh, R2 times S1 in this case. So the collective response of the family of, of, uh, of profiles to the image can now be written as a function on this feature space that associates, to, associates each point x, y, theta of the space with the uh, response of the corresponding profile to, uh, to the image I. Now, um, so as I was saying, we want to, um, to starting from any family of filters that represents some set of profiles, of receptive profiles in V1, we want to say something about the lateral connectivity induced by them uh, in terms of a metric on a feature space. Now, in principle, a feature space is any set indexing the family of filters in, in uh, in, uh, that, that we are considering. So it can have some uh, pre-existing geometric structures as is the case for rotations and translations or also dilations introducing also scale as another parameter. So in these cases, we have uh, feature spaces that have a product form given by position times some, some other features. So these other features are, uh, do not need to be necessarily um, parameterized with some geometric structure. So for instance, uh, if we suppose that we have a bank of filters that are convolutional filters that are learned from, from data, in that case, we have the, the invariance by translation. So we have the first two positional coordinates, but then the first, the first, the, the third index, sorry, uh, is just an index in this case we, because the, the filters are learned. So the features in that case wouldn't be uh, explicitly parameterized. Or even more generally, we can have a bunch of filters with no parameterization of any kind. So I'm talking about a feature space that's just some sort of, um, of geometric structure uh, because I'm about to define one. But in principle, for now, um, a feature, I'm calling a feature space just any set that is in a one-to-one -one correspondence with a set of filters. And in any case, in all these cases, we can still lift an image I to that feature space uh, um, by means of the filtering operation. So as a function of the feature space. Uh, so um, now given a set of receptive profiles, the distance that I want to define on the feature space is very simply defined as the uh, restriction of the L2 distance between the filters. So given two points P and P0 in the, in the feature space, uh, we are defining the distance between them just as the L2 distance between the two corresponding filters that are Psi P and Psi P0 indexed by these two points in the feature space. So we're defining a metric space. Uh, now in L2, we also have a scalar product and we use it to define a, um, a kernel on the feature space that describes the strength of interaction between two units. Now, um, if we assume all the filters to be normalized to the same L2 norm, um, we get that the square distance is just obtained as uh, a constant minus twice the kernel. So this means that points that are closed with, according to the distance are going to be strongly connected according to the kernel. Um, so now to compute the kernel, what we do is just take the integral of the product between two filters. So basically we are interested in what happens when we superpose uh, the two filters um, by uh, possibly shifting them. 
So just to give some intuition, I'm showing here some possible configurations that we can have for, uh, for Gabor-like oriented filters. So um, if the two filters are oriented the same, but they are just lightly shifted along the, um, the, the axis of the preferred orientation, what happens is that the product is still positive and the value of the, their integral, so the value of the kernel is still, is still high and close to the maximum, whereas if the displacement is larger, at some point the uh, filters are not overlapping anymore and uh, the interaction according to this measure is going to be zero. Uh, or we can have a negative interaction uh, when the displacement happens um, along the axis that is orthogonal to the preferred orientation because we have a superposition of lobes with different signs. Uh, on the other hand, when the filters are centered at the same point, uh, of course, if they orient, their orientation is similar, they are still going to have a strong interaction. Whereas, for example, if they are orthogonal, they don't interact at all. So this was to, um, to give some intuition about, how, uh, about why we're defining the kernel this way. Now, um, as I was saying, as soon as the uh, two filters do not overlap anymore, uh, according to this measure of interaction, we have a um, we have a zero interaction for non-overlapping filters. So, but on the other hand, I was saying that uh, lateral connections in V one are uh, long-range connections. So, to model that we uh, want to propagate the action of this local kernel um, by means of an iterative procedure. So this is to obtain a wider kernel that gives a possibly non-zero measure of interaction between two uh, non-overlapping filters. So intuitively, we may think of connecting to these joint filters um, by taking local steps uh, via a chain of, uh, of profiles that each connected to the next according to the local connectivity or more precisely, what we do is um, impose a discretized reproducing property for this kernel. So a convenient setting to do this is that of metric measure spaces. Uh, so we have defined a metric space and we can, and now we want to define a measure on it. So a possible choice is the spherical house of measure associated with the distance that can always be defined on, on a metric space and it's also well behaved with respect to coexisting geometric structures. So, for instance, if we uh, have a Riemannian distance and we compute the Hauser measure associated with it, we get something that, it, that coincides up to a constant with the Riemannian volume form. Or another example is a discrete case that is important for a computational context where the measure just reduces to the to the counting measure. So now. Uh, we fix a starting point for our propagation, so a point P0 belonging to the feature space F, and we denote by K1, P0, um, the local kernel computed around this point, so we fix P0 and we let P vary, uh, the, the other argument vary. So we, apply, we also apply the sigmodal function to the kernel and we normalize it. So this is the generating kernel, let's say, of our propagation. And then we define a sequence of kernel, kernels where the kernel of step n is obtained by integrating the, step, the kernel of step n minus one against the local kernel k1. So this um, kind of looks like a discretized diffusion on the uh, metric measure of space. And also thanks to the relationship between k and the distance d, by applying the, the sigmodal function in the generating kernel, we actually obtain an exponential decay function of the square distance that kind of resembles a heat kernel. So if, as a first example, um, simple cells in V1, as we know, are often modeled um, as a bank of Gabor filters obtained, uh, from, uh, obtained by rotations and translations of a of a filter psi that is given by a complex, complex exponential um, modulated by a Gaussian envelope. So in this case, the feature space, as I was mentioning before, is the rotor translation group, R2 times S1. 
So this already has a pre-existing uh, geometric structure, uh, a lead group structure. And this was actually used in previous work by, by Chitti and Sarti to, uh, describe, to describe lateral connections of the one in terms of a um, sub-Riemannian diffusion operator on this, um, on this space. Uh, but in order to define our distance on this feature space, we're not using any of the uh, differential or group structures. Uh, of the of the feature space, but just the a sort of measure of compatibility between the um, between the shapes of the receptive profiles. Um, so the distance in this case can be computed analytically, and it can be shown uh, to be locally equivalent to a um, a Riemannian distance on this space. So we are actually reobtaining a differential structure, and what's more, this Riemannian distance. Um, degenerates to the sub Riemannian structure defined by, by Chitti and Sarti as the scale of the filters uh, goes to zero and their frequency goes to infinity. So uh, in other terms, when the tuning of the filters to, uh, to position and orientation becomes infinitely sharp. So um, here we have two level sets, one level set of the distance induced by the profiles in, in green and in red the level set of the, of the distance in, uh, of the sub Riemannian distance. Uh, so we can see that if we apply our framework to a family of Gabor filters, what we obtain is as a limit case, an existing differential model of the, um, of the connectivity of the one. Um, so here's what happens uh, again in the Gabor case when we uh, propagate the kernel. So if we fix a starting point P0, in this case zero in R2 times plus one, uh, we have this uh, on the left, the starting filter or more precisely its real part. And uh, we can compute the local kernel around this point and uh, propagate it according to the procedure that I was describing before. So the kernel actually around the point is actually a three-dimensional object. So to visualize it, we project it down onto the XY plane um, by taking the maximum over the, um, the orientation of theta. And we can also uh, define an association field induced by this, uh, by this connectivity that is composed by the orientation theta that maximizes the kernel value at each x, y point. So um, what we obtain, um, what we obtain is a connectivity that spreads along the axis of the preferred orientation of the, of the starting cell. And, it, and the, the induced association field also shows patterns of collinearity and co-circularity that are compatible with psychophysical association fields. Now, uh, taking R2 times S1 as a feature space uh, means assuming that over each point X, Y, we, we have a whole fiber of orientations, um, which is a, implements sort of ice cube model of the one. Um, but actually, in, as also Jean was, was pointing out before, the uh, distribution of, uh, of orientation preference over the cortical surface is uh, more of a uh, halfway kind of space. Um, and the hypercolumnar structures are, structure is actually collapsed onto a surface with forming pinwheel arrangements. So we could, um, so, mm, and this, this would mean that for each point x, y, we just have one orientation theta at this resolution. Uh, and so in other terms, theta can be written as a function of x, y. So with this more realistic representation, our feature space becomes bidimensional and it can be parameterized as a surface contained in R2 times S1. So given by x, y, and theta of x, y, given an orientation map theta. So, uh, the distance in this case is computed by only using those filters that lie on the surface and the kernel, the, the, the connectivity kernel lives on the, on the surface F as well. So uh, the kernel matches the geometry of the orientation map and we obtain a connectivity that is not only orientation specific but also uh, patchy with peaks on, on coherent orientations. So, 
I want to stress that the visualizations here are not projections in this case, because uh, the propagation of the kernel happens in within the surface itself, so in the in this bi-dimensional feature space. And we're not using the other Gower filters that live outside the surface. And finally, I want to show two, two more examples. So first, we uh, computed the connectivity pattern that is induced by a family of end stopped uh, profiles. So with antagonistic end zones that suppress the response to stimuli that are longer than the central than the central lobe. So this kind of, this kind of cells have been shown to react to curved stimuli. Uh, and previous work has analyzed the relationship between the length of the of the filter of the of the profile and the curvature of the stimuli. So we considered different families of end stopped cells with different length, and, and we obtain we obtained curved association fields with curvature increasing curvature with um, with decreasing length of the filters consistently with um, previous uh, findings. Um, and finally, we we computed the, the connectivity pattern associated with a bank of learned filters. So in particular, we considered a bank of filters learned as a, as a sparse basis for natural images, for the statistics of natural images. And, and these filters are uh, invariant by translations. Uh, so the feature space, as I was mentioning before, is still of a pro still has a product form where the first two coordinates are at x y coordinates so spatial coordinates but the third coordinate is just an index because the filters are learned so uh, the other features are not uh, explicitly parameterized and even in this case what we obtain is uh, a pattern of in the in the induced association fields uh, is a pattern of collinearity and co-circularity even though the orientation was not explicitly parameterized um, so just to sum up, we mm, given a set of filters um, of filters that are modeling some family of receptive profiles in V1. What we propose is an approach to uh, to modeling the geometry of the uh, connectivity pattern associated with the set of profiles, and this is because this is built as a sort of measure of compatibility between the, the receptive profiles, so between the feature selectivity of the two filters. And this gives a local connectivity measure that we propagate uh, um, to obtain long range connections. So the, the framework makes very few assumptions, so it's quite flexible and it can apply to uh, very different banks of filters. So in the Gabor case, we obtained a um, existing differential model of, of lateral connectivity as a uh, limit case for our distance. And, uh, but then we can also get rid of the ice cube abstraction and model the connectivity associated with a, with a uh, orientation map or, um, or model the connectivity uh, that, um, that is induced by uh, profiles uh, sensitive to different features, not only orientation. And finally, as I was saying, we don't necessarily need some ordering on the fiber and, or parameterization uh, of the features to, uh, to compute the connectivity pattern associated with a, with a bank of filters. Um, that was all. So thanks a lot for listening and for any questions or comments you may have. Thank you very much, Noemi, for the beautiful talk. So are there any questions from the others? I have a small one, but... Uh, I have a quick question, if I can. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, thanks a lot. It was really clear. Uh, it was really, really nice talk. So I wanted to ask you something about this last example you show about these um, learned uh, filters. So. This thing that like you can say something about the connectivity even when you don't have any parameters is very interesting. I was wondering if you find any any sort of analogies in the connectivity for these filters with the connectivity that you find with any family, uh, for instance, of parameterized filters, the one depending on orientation. So like if you see, if you can compare really these two connectivities somehow. Um... 
Uh, yeah, not 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 in a in a um, complete way, but yeah, I um, had started to do something in that direction. Uh, that is specifically trying to um, to see if the if the uh, modeled connectivity so obtained from the uh, let's say the um, filter convolution uh, yeah. is kind of similar to a. To, to some um, like differential model of connectivity, yeah. for instance, yeah. with, a, with a like fundamental solution to a submanual Laplacian or something like that. And so, yeah, um, this is not complete, but yeah, we were trying to see if there was, in terms of correlation between the two kernels, uh, okay. something because uh, that that means, of course, that means giving a parameterization to those filters. So a way to do that is uh, taking the learned filters and trying to approximate, approximate them with the yes. function. So and define an ordering on the fiber, and based on that ordering, uh, trying to to see if the analytic kernel and the empirical kernel, let's say, are are similar. And I don't have any like final results, but uh, it was kind of going in that direction, yes. Yeah, it's very interesting because I think it would be helpful to see, to validate somehow these filters uh, and to see how they perform. That's, but that's very interesting, thanks. Thank you. And yeah, let me add that I, I think that my question was like very related. I wanted to know if you tried or if you think you expect any like explicit, if you can like extract any explicit relation of a Sabrimanian heat kernel or any like, uh, information of this type, like fundamental solution of some Brumanian Laplacians, like in these KN that you are proposing, but I guess that you kind of answered already. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I answered the same to, to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, you expect it. Okay. So, it would be nice to see your future work in this direction then. Thank you very much. Um, any more questions? Maybe. I have a very uh, naive uh, question. I, I'm a bit conf not confused, but uh, the learning procedure is based on uh, when you consider the input images for the learning, for, uh, for the uh, construction of those learned filters. Is, is there a specific set of input images or? Uh... Uh, yeah, in this case, yes. Uh, of course, like um, in this specific case, this was a data set of natural images. These are not like, uh, this comes from a work of Oshausen and Field. Uh, and so I just used the uh, published algorithm to generate okay. this, this bank of filters, but it can be done uh, in principle for maybe the first layer of a convolutional network or any kind of, um, of um, learning procedure from, from natural images or even, even from different sets of images where different feature selectivity may, be, may emerge. Okay, well, I'm asking this question because it would be really interesting to see, for example, if you give a very restricted set, like they do with cats, for example, on the horizontal bars and the, then when they observe the cats, they cannot really capture the vertical structures in the nature. And when you do the same with your uh, learning procedure, you. I mean, when probably you would end up with uh, these, uh, let's say, deficient, uh, deficient receptive profiles, which could not uh, capture the uh, capture the vertical structures and so on. I mean, this kind of experiments could be validated by uh, by your method. It would be really interesting to see uh, this kind of things. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, I think, I think yes. I mean, I mean since the, the connectivity that is is completely induced by the receptive profiles, I would expect it to be to be exactly deficient, uh, deficient as the filters are. So yeah, not able to turn maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thanks a lot. It's a really nice uh, work. So yeah. thank you very much, Noemi. I don't know, maybe it's better if we move to the next yeah. speaker. Yeah. And then again, if we like for more